Uh, okay. Good. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the reminder. And I'm going to go into full screen too. So, all right. Um, so, welcome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ole. I'm one of the volunteers of the um, High Data Cambridge Meetup, and this is our 33rd Meetup for July 2021. And um, quick introduction um, and, and uh, overview of the agenda. We have two talks. Um, so the first one is by Tariq on the EU's proposed regulations on AI, uh, an overview. And the second one is by Nishat, an introduction to NURPS with an aerodynamics example. NURPS, is that the right pronunciation? I, I hope so. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay. I mean, it's an acronym. You're not really supposed to uh, have, a, have, a, have an official pronunciation, I'm sure. But yeah, yeah. NURPS is fine by me. Cool. Um, Right, so, so very quickly, a few words about us, the PyData Cambridge chapter. Um, so um, we are part of uh, the outreach program of NumFocus, which is a US-based nonprofit that um, is dedicated to the promotion of, of open source software, and in particular, uh, open source software with a focus on, on data science and, and analytics. So we are part of the outreach program. We were inaugurated in November, 2018. Since then, we've been running meetups nearly every month uh, in person in Cambridge until the pandemic and, and virtual since then. And every last Wednesday of the month as of, you know, like as, as in today. And um, there are four people um, organizing this, this meetup together. Uh, Federico, who unfortunately cannot make it today because he's on vacation, Joris, Leandro, and Ole. And uh, we are all volunteers, so, so we, we have daytime jobs, but we are doing this on the side. And uh, looking at this list, I, I, I am reminded, at this list of names, I'm reminded that this is the last uh, meetup for Joris uh, where he is going to be in the UK at least. So, so he's moving to South Korea um, for a new job in uh, soon. So um, he is uh, going to be most likely less involved with the meetup afterwards, just because of the geographical distance. So thanks a lot to, to Joris for his, his work and, and, and dedication and, and input to the meetup. Um, so, so a quick, um, quick word about NumFocus. As I said, NumFocus is, um, is a, a nonprofit that promotes open source software. Um, a lot of the open source projects that you are familiar with um, are supported by NumFocus in various ways. So sometimes there's sort of uh, there's direct direct funding going to the developers of, of these projects. Sometimes uh, there's sort of more indirect support in, in terms of uh, coaching um, uh, going on. Um, as the name suggests, uh, in, in PyData, a lot of these um, old projects are in the Python space, but uh, recently NumFocus has also branched out into, into other languages and, and software ecosystems. So there's Julia on the list, for instance, and I think um, Stan, was at some point supported as well. Yes, and Stan is also still on the list. So, so it's it's a with a focus on Python, but not only Python. And um, as I said, we are not. This is here. Um, this is uh, all run by volunteers. Um, so we are not doing this for the money. But um, and your num focus is also non profit institution. But if you um, if you are so inclined, consider donating to NumFocus. There's a link at the uh, bottom of the page and any donation that you give will directly go to the support of uh, open source software. Um, since we are part of uh, the NumFocus outreach program, we are also bound by their code of conduct. Uh, so here just very briefly a summer, uh, uh, summary of this code of conduct. It's, it's quite simple, be professional. Um, you know, no, don't know, we cannot tolerate any insults or put down of other people and any sort of harassment, it, 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 sh it should be common sense, of course. Um, if you think something happened at a meetup which sort of violate this, which violated the, the code of conduct, you can um, 
they have a code of conduct response team that you can reach out to. So first of all, you can speak to all of us, the organizers, um, but you can also, we have also like, uh, you have also an external person, Leonie Mück, who is also affiliated with, with NAM Focus. And you can also reach out to her if you prefer to discuss your concerns with an outside person, so someone who's not involved directly with the meetup. Um, <clears throat> We are also um, supported by several organizations uh, in uh, Cambridge, based in Cambridge and outside. So um, these are ARM, FETCHAI, NumFocus, as already mentioned, and the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Um, uh, so, so all these organizations support us or um, in various ways, for instance, by paying for our Zoom accounts for, for the meetup.com fees and so on and so forth. Uh, and and uh, when at the time when we were meeting in person, uh, Arm also used to generously support uh, us with with uh, pizza every month. Month this was great. So um, you know, keep this uh, keep these organizations in mind. Um, and um, and uh, when you're I don't know looking for a job or or something like that, and just sort of like a couple of news from these. Sponsor so FetchAI is a is a machine learning um, startup based in in Cambridge. They are heavily involved in um, in uh, agent technology and and have a couple of products ar around distributed ledgers inspired by by blockchain. So very interesting technology. You see a couple of their announcements and, and links to where you find further information on this page. I should also mention that uh, Fetch AI is hiring in various areas around uh, software development, machine learning, uh, and so on and so forth. So if you think this sounds cool, then please have a look at their website. Um, then there's ARM. ARM is uh, also a company uh, headquartered here in Cambridge uh, in the, the semiconductor and chip design business. Um, they have also regularly uh, job openings around uh, data and software engineering and um, Python. So if, if um, you're interested in that, you can either go uh, to the web page directly or you can uh, speak to the volunteers, Federico and Leandro. Leandro is uh, also here on the call, so you can message him directly. Um, okay, uh, a couple of other bits and pieces for information. Um, I forgot to mention in the beginning that we are recording this meetup. So, um, uh, so my video, my voice, and this uh, will be recorded and of all other speakers. Um, we, we usually um, upload these videos with some delay to the PyData YouTube channel. So I will share the link to the recording on the meetup page. If you have any concerns about that, uh, then please reach out and let us know. Um, uh, then our usual announcement, we are always looking for speakers. Um, so if you, you want to present something, there's really a lot of flexibility. It doesn't have to be like a super polished or very long talk, but if you have some ideas, want to discuss, do reach out. We are also always looking for sponsors. So if you have a company that want to broadcast job opportunities or, or you know, get in touch with, with data scientists uh, in, in the Cambridge area, you know, come talk to us. And um, with uh, Joris um, leaving, we, we are also looking for, um, I would say one person to, to join the, the organizing team at some point in, in the future. So it's not maybe sort of like an immediate commitment, but we are hoping to find someone at some point over the next couple of months. So if that interests you as well, you can reach us below at the bottom of the page. Uh, links to a uh, YouTube channel, our Twitter account, and our email. Um, um, so, and I can post that in the chat as well. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand over to the first speaker who is Tariq Ashid, who is going to speak to us about AI regulations as proposed by the EU. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um... It's great to be here. Um, uh, just to kind of um, very quickly introduce myself, I've spent about 20, 25 years working in technology, small companies, big companies, about a decade in central government. So I've seen the impact of data and algorithms on individuals and communities. Um, I'm currently focused on helping organizations understand the risks around the use of data and algorithms, similar to how 
Uh, some people do the same for information security. Um, I'll start sharing my screen now um, and hopefully that will work. Can everyone see uh, a big blue slide? Yeah, I can see it. Yep. Fantastic. So what I want to do today is just to give an overview of uh, what has been happening um, at the EU level in terms of regulating the use of data automation and quotes AI. Um, it's important to say that these are proposals for regulation, so they're not set in stone and some elements are likely to change in the next year or two. Um, when I say an overview in the next 10, 15 minutes, we can't go into a lot of detail, but I want to give you um, a feel for where we have come from, um, some of the other um, standards and regulations that have informed this, so you can understand the kind of historic journey we are on. Um, and I know many people here are very technical and you know, data scientists and analysts, but it's always useful to understand the wider context in which we work, the regulatory context. So very, very simplified um, timeframe. Um, GDPR was very significant for many of us um, and it landed in 2016. Uh, it was a few years in development and its focus was on data protection and privacy, which at the time and for the preceding sort of decade, that was the main concern for society. At that stage, um, the state of the art, the availability of you know, advanced algorithms, um, you know, the use of data, uh, it wasn't uh, as prevalent in, in, uh, in industry. And therefore the questions around, is this safe to do? Is this fair use of data? Is this a safe use of algorithms? It wasn't such a uh, big concern, but that concern has been growing. And naturally now that has resulted in both consultations around what um, legislation regulation should look like and now a draft uh, proposal. I've also put in here 2019, the ethics guidelines that the EU produced, which are um, not regulation, but they set out a conceptual framework uh, for thinking about what is important, what isn't, what are we trying to preserve, what are the fundamental principles. Um, and it was actually very influential. It, um, it, it, it was copied and pasted, or, or uh, it inspired many governments around the world in terms of their own um, um, uh, publications on how to think about safe, fair and ethical use of data and algorithms. And the private sector also took up um, uh, some of that framework as well. So I put it here because it's um, very influential on these um, regulations and also very influential in how um, many organizations think about it. It's a very short document. I think it's 37 pages long, very easy to read, plain English, I recommend it. Um, there's a lot of stuff that um, official organizations put out that's unreadable, <laughs> including in the UK. So I, I, uh, I, would, I would definitely recommend this one. There's some links here which you can follow up afterwards. Um, it's worth just very quickly sharing a picture of some of the principles that drive the GDPR so you can understand the history of where we've come from. GDPR was about minimizing the data that you collect and keep around accuracy, accountability, securing that data so it's you know, not, um, author it's not accessed by unauthorized people and so on. So we are now very familiar with these um, principles, but they continue um, and uh, they, they, they are a foundation on which the new regulations build. Um, as I've mentioned, the, you know, the last two, three years has been very active in terms of many governments and many you know, official bodies like the Turing Institute and um, uh, the, the Ada Lovelace Institute and so on, doing lots of work around, well, what should regulation look like? What are the principles through which we analyze um, uh, the, you know, the quality of a system? And here are some, some, some interesting ones that you should look at. And again, if you only look at one, look at the EU uh, ethics guidelines. Those ethics guidelines set out um, seven um, principles, um, which um, many of us agree are probably the right ones. Um, they talk about um, governance and accountability. They talk about technical robustness, safety, you know, what we might call accuracy and performance. Uh, they talk about privacy data governance, which relates to the GDPR, but they ask us to think bigger as well. They ask us to think about the wider societal impacts of our automated decision-making. 
So not just thinking about the individual, but actually what happens to small scale effects, scale up and affect societies or communities as a whole. There's a green aspect to this as well. Should, you know, are we justified in consuming so much energy and generating language models and so on? Uh, transparency is really important principle because we can't trust something if we don't understand how it works. If somebody tells us how something works, that's just them telling us. If they show us, if they open it, that is a key requirement for trust and trans uh, transparency, a key requirement there. Um, many people have talked about, you know, making sure that our uh, algorithms aren't biased, that they are fair. And another key point, which many of you will be familiar with, is, is around human oversight um, and human agency so that those who are the subjects of the algorithms, you know, the, the users or the victims, <laughs> um, have uh, an ability to come back and say, actually, this is wrong, or I don't like this uh, automated decision, can we fix it? Um, too often that is um, scaled out in the sense that, you know, organizations don't want to do that, they want to automate everything, and there is no working feedback mechanism. So these are the um, um, principles that were set out in the EU ethics frameworks, and they continue to be important into the regulation. So the regulation refers back to existing frameworks. So I just want to say a few things about, um, um, a little bit of technical things about what the regulation is. So it's a regulation, not a directive. So it's like the GDPR. So directives are objectives or goals and national governments will interpret them and create their own national laws. Whereas regulations are actually implemented directly. They're not interpreted. They are, um, they, they, are the, they become the law. And it's the same law across the EU, across the 27 member states. Um, it also means that the ultimate bodies that decides on you know, judicial cases or conformance standards is the EU not local governments so there is there it reduces the risk of divergence it has teeth like the gdpr um, this one um, the current um, proposals say you know there's various classes of uh, failure which attract two to six percent of global turnover which is quite significant in other cases it's that or minimum you know the 30 million so th they, they mean this um, it's not a toothless regulation like the gdpr it's extraterritorial um, what do I mean by this? What I mean is that it applies when citizens of the EU are affected. So if you are a developer or, or builder of a service that's based in the US, in South Korea, in the UK, um, you, if your users are in the EU, they have the, they have the protections of this uh, regulation. Um, so th that hasn't always been the case. And what it means is that... Um, if you have, um, you know, if you're a startup or a big company in the UK developing services, you have to think about your EU users. And there's 450 million people in the EU, and the EU is a sixth of the world, you know, a sixth of the world economy. So it's hard to ignore that. And this, this, like the GDPR, creates a harmonizing effect. It means that organizations in the US, um, in Asia, in the UK now, can't ignore the EU regulations, and what often happens is it is um, they could they either create special versions of their products and services that meet the EU standards, or they just say, Do you know what, it's just easier to achieve the high standards set by the EU, and 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 and, and just be just do that. Um, so you've seen now with the GDPR that sometimes some services are different when the consumer is in the EU or in the US. Um, and this is seen as you know, positive because it raises the bar and it makes people ask, well, why am I not receiving the high standards that you have set? Why should I put up with less protections from, from, from elsewhere? And I'll come back to this question of, does this stifle innovation a lot? I'll come back to that at the end. Um, the other thing to say is, and, and many lessons learned from um, um, you know, so 20, 30 years of information security, um, it's important that there is conceptual clarity, a clear philosophy underneath regulations, because then you understand why you are implementing controls, implementing processes and standards. If you don't know why you're doing it and you're just told to do a control or a mechanism or a technical thing, 
you know, it, 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 you know, it's not satisfactory and you don't know whether it's proportionate. And we spend too long in information security um, uh, uh, implementing controls and not really understanding whether they're necessary. And a prescription led um, approach means that people, there's unnecessary cost. It creates a tick boxing culture and there's less flexibility in actually thinking about what the risks are. So it's always important to have that conceptual clarity. I'm a big fan of this. We learned a lot of lessons in uh, information security in, in central government, for example, where we moved away from prescription towards principles and objectives and allowed people to think about, well, what are the different ways we can achieve this? And, and in this case, just like the GDPR, it's about human dignity, human rights, uh, which many of us agree on. Um, they're, they're kind of the axioms, as it were. Um, the big feature which everyone is talking about um, is that the, the, the this proposed regulations creates four classes of um, um, uh, of, of AI systems, uh, risk based, uh, risk to human rights, um, and a lot of the um, uh, discussion centers on these four categories. So I'll just kind of uh, explain them. There's unacceptable risk, which means they're prohibited. Um, and that includes things like social scoring by governments. And we know that some governments do this, so that will be prohibited. Uh, exploiting vulnerabilities of children, use of subliminal techniques um, to influence your behavior, um, which is an interesting challenge to social media because that clearly uses those techniques. So we'll see how that pans out. Um, the use of biometric identification um, in real time, there's some confusion there because it is banned with some exceptions and those exceptions depend on um, a technical description, which I'll come back to. So essentially the message I'm giving you is the proposals are out and people are reading them and saying, actually, this is not clear enough or there are areas here which are subject to interpretation. But it's, it's useful to understand that there's a whole category of prohibited um, uh, use of uh, algorithms. There's high risk, which is the most interesting because they are areas that we want to build solutions in, medical equipment, financial services, government public services, you know, self-driving cars, autopilots, you know, education, you know, scoring your work, um, uh, automating the process of recruitment, you know, automated interviews or CV scanning. These things are important and they affect people's lives if they go wrong, or even small biases when scaled out um, can affect entire communities. So those are high risk, uh, but also the most interesting for us to try and get right. Limited risk, um, the definition isn't totally clear, but there's still a requirement that users are told that they are using an AI so that they are clear they can move away. Minimal risk, you might say, well, what is minimal risk? There is no minimal risk, uh, but they list some examples like video game AI or spam filters. And I guess you could call that very low risk. So the high risk category attracts um, obligations, uh, standards for certification, things you have to do. Um, and, and none of those things should surprise you. you know, it's things that we've all been talking about for years now, you know, a, a proper risk assessment, um, making sure you understand the quality of your data sets. Um, the proposals actually set out the, you know, term, the words would say they should be high quality data sets, but some of the challenge to that is, well, what do you mean by high quality? So there's some stuff to be worked out, but the you know, direction is clear. Um, they talk about logging, but many of us interpret that as auditability, reproducibility. Um, they talk about detailed documentation. We interpret that as transparency. What, what is it that you've built? How does it work? What has been the testing process? You know, uh, who did you test it on? Clearly, you know, uh, in making sure that users understand um, you know, their own rights and the fact that they are using an automated system and so on. So these are the things that you would expect. And many organizations are now getting good at doing this, but not everyone. Um, and it is a challenge for startups because their costs are limited, of course. Um, as I said, it's a proposal. And at the moment, you know, the, the community is very busy in reading it and challenging it and having talks about it. And here's some of the things, I just want to give you a flavor of some of the things that people don't like about the proposals. So although the proposals have tried to be principles-based, they do veer into describing things in technical terms, like what is an AI system? What is real-time use of 
biometric identification, does that mean five minutes later is not real time? So there's some, the risk there is that the, the technical definitions create loopholes because they are not uh, sufficiently uh, covering uh, the intended you know, um, implementations. So there's some challenges there. Um, some uh, civil rights uh, groups uh, think that the, there isn't enough um, uh, talk about creating the uh, process of feedback or redress for people to say, I don't agree with this. So with GDPR, you could say, I want to know what information you've got on me. I want to know how you used it and I disagree with this. There isn't yet an equivalent in the, in the proposals. Um, there are exemptions um, which could be misused, you know, uh, detecting detection and identification of criminals that could be you know, really widened to all kinds of uses. Um, there are some understandable um, uses, missing children and imminent terrorism. Um, the military as a blanket is exempt from, from this. And for some people, this is concerning you know, automated weapons. That, that's a big area of concern for many people. Um, there's a practical bureaucratic challenge as well, because the idea is that high risk systems that we've talked about have to be certified and entered into a catalog, a database, an EUI database. So some people are thinking, this is, this is crazy. You can't do that. That's too much paperwork, too much uh, bureaucracy. But actually, the challenge back to that is there is already um, uh, equivalent systems for you know, electrical safety and you know, uh, the FCC in the USA and the CE standards in the, in the EU. So maybe it is possible, maybe it is not. Um, almost final slide now. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of big question around, well, does this regulation stifle innovation? Is it too much for small companies to try out new ideas because the cost of meeting those standards and obligations is too high? Uh, if you can see in the background, there is a picture of somebody, I won't say who they are, but they're a very high profile person in the UK government uh, who enjoys talking about technology. And this person said that actually the EU own, regulation only helps the incumbent large organizations cement their position and it prevents and keeps out smaller uh, businesses and kind of you know, innovation. But actually the same thing was said about the GDPR, that it would stifle innovation, that it was too costly. But now across you know, all those different groups, generally it's considered a success generally. I mean, there's annoying things about it. And what it has done is it hasn't stifled innovation. What it has done is set out a clear picture of what good business models look like as well as saying these business models are not welcome. And this is the ambition for the uh, AI proposals as well. Um, and just an indication that they are thinking about um, uh, innovation. Um, you know, the, the proposals talk about regulatory sandboxes. So the, the willingness to learn by saying, okay, we'll pick a few companies and allow them to experiment to see, you know, does the current uh, regulation, uh, is it good enough? Can it be improved? Are we stopping good uses of, of data and algorithms? Um, I'll stop there because I know we only had a few minutes to talk, but I hope that's given you um, a kind of an overview of where we've come from and where we're going and just an overall shape of the regulations. And if you're very keen on, um, if, you, if you are scared by them or if you think they're wrong, you know, they're, they're, it's currently, um, you know, there is a chance to um, contact um, your representatives and encourage change. Um, thank you for listening. Um, if you want to talk to me, I'm I'm at Digital Time so you can find me on the internet. Fantastic. So, thank you very much. Um, I, you. I didn't say it in the beginning, um, but the, uh, to, the, to the audience, you, you, there is a Q&A function that you can use to ask questions, and, or you can also post them in the chat function if you want to. Um, maybe uh, I'll... I'll buy uh, everyone in the audience some time to, to think of uh, a question or formulate their question by asking one quick question myself. Sure. Um, Tariq, I, I, was, I was wondering, uh, do these regulations also define what exactly an AI algorithm is? I mean, if I'm, let's say, a startup and I use k-means clustering or something like that to segment my you know, visitors yeah. to my website somehow. Yeah. Is that already an AI algorithm, an application yeah. of AI? Yeah, so the, the, the answer is they, they do attempt to define 
um, what kinds of algorithms are covered by the by the proposals. And this is problematic because you can yeah. always find uh, an algorithm which is on the edge or fuzzy or just outside. Um, and this is why many people are, are warning against uh, overly prescriptive descriptions. Um, the, the, the lawmakers at the moment are saying that they will keep updating the proposals, but you can't do that in an agile way. You can't do that every six months. So there's some risks there. But, but actually, overall, if we take a step back, um, I would say that from a position of no regulation to a position where you're regulating 80% of algorithms that really should be implemented, regulated because they have the risk to people, um, that is better than allowing perfection to be the enemy of you know, getting it 80% right. So yeah. yes, there are challenges um, and you will always find, um, you know, is K means AI or not? <laughs> is a linear regression AI or not? You know, yeah. um, <laughs> um, is everything is everything in AI linear regression? You know, <laughs> uh, so 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 you know th that's a mathematical discussion. Um, but I think overall the the the, uh, the it I think there will be more good than bad, and we just have to make sure that um, the approach isn't discredited by too many people um, saying actually this this doesn't fit and now. The regulation looks silly. I think the, the, that's the, the reputation risk is the biggest there. Sure, sure, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I have I'm happy to stay right to the end. So if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'm happy to talk at the end as well. Yeah, sure. So I got one as well, Wally. If, uh, yes, sure, go? of course. Yeah, okay. So well, I was uh, hearing to the talk and I, I was thinking, uh wouldn't be or wouldn't make more sense to uh rather than certifying and qualifying the algorithms that uh, are created to certify and qualify the people who create and in kind of some way make them accountable for the decisions for the models and algorithms that they deploy to the population rather than on the on the machines and the techniques yeah i think that's a, a very good um uh, uh point um so if we look at established industries because people think that uh, ai is very new and but often we can learn from other sectors um so if we look at um information security or even medicine or even engineering civil engineering building engineering you do both you you create a class of people who um you certify as having sufficient um, learning, knowledge, experience, expertise. Um, so you can trust them um, either to do the assessments or to you know, build things. And then when things are, are carry enough risk that they can hurt people, either physically or in terms of life chances, you want to certify the systems. So you certify buildings as being safe. You certify medical equipment, even though the people who built them are already certified. Um, in information security, you have qualified professionals of various standards and they wear, they wear various hats and badges, but the systems they design and build also in various sectors have to be uh, accredited or assured or certified. Um, so you, we, we end up doing both. Um, and I think that's the same that will happen here. So yes, there is a focus, unfortunately, on the, in, the, in the proposed regulations on certifying systems. You raise a good point. We should also um, uh, think about certifying individuals. Personally, I think um, in the development of uh, this profession, we're still too early. You know, we are where we were 20, 30 years ago with information security. There are people who are good at it, but there wasn't yet enough consensus around what does it mean um, for somebody to be given a certification, but we will get there. Um, overall, the more fundamental point um, that the regulation the upholds is that even if systems are certified, the ultimate accountability and responsibility lies with individuals. So it's very firm on not separating systems from the people who build them, run them, and are accountable for them. So you can't blame the system like the government recently did last summer with you know the the mutant AI, the mutant algorithm that that created crazy A-level results for students. That was a uh, an intention, perhaps, 
to distance, create some distance between the algorithm and those who should have been responsible for its quality and its performance. Um, so I'm really pleased that the, um, the proposed regulations do reaffirm, restate that it's individuals who are responsible. But that's a really, really good question. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, and your answer makes a lot of sense. I was just thinking as a follow-up question, do you know or do you have any data points on the existing industries? I, I can think of like a, a bank investment is, a, is an industry that certify people, I think, to, to take the decision and give them kind of a counseling or, or whatnot. But do you know mm. in these established industries what came first, certifying the systems or certifying the people? Um, I don't know um, about those. Um, that's a really good question, and I should, uh, for my own learning, look it up. Um, did did, um, did 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 the certification of buildings come first, or did um, the certifying builders come first? Um, that's a really good question. Yeah, I, I I will go away and look that up. I think it's very very interesting. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much for the talk. Yeah. Th uh, thank you. Great question. Yes. Um... I think in, in the interest of, of time, I think we should c conclude uh, here. And if anyone has a, has a follow-up question, you know, uh, please do reach out to Tariq um, using the chat. Um, right. Um, I think uh, I think in, in the I think in the agenda I put uh, I wrote sort of like uh, that we would have a short interval, but um, I, I would. If, if there are no objections, I would suggest we, um, you know, we, we move straight to the next talk, if that's okay. Nishat, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, fantastic. Great. Um, so I, I, I must uh, uh, apologize here. I, I know you sent me a brief biography and I wanted to use that to, to introduce you before your talk. Um, uh, but I, I unfortunately I, I put uh, I downloaded the email to my to another laptop and and now I can't reach it. Very sorry about that. Would you mind uh, just helping me by by saying a few words uh, about what you do be, before your before your talk? That would be a great help. Sure. Um, okay. Then uh, the, the stage is yours. Thank you. I will share my screen and um, talk about myself once I've done that. Are you able to see my slide? Yes, looks great. Brilliant. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name is Nishad. Um, by way of introduction, um, I work at CMR Surgical uh, uh, in a team of kind of data scientists and engineers. Um, I, I mainly do data engineering. Um, Previously, um, I was at the Whittle Lab uh, at the University of Cambridge um, doing some aeronautics research. Um, and the, the work that I did, the, the, I'm talking today about um, some of the work that I did while I was at the, at the Whittle Lab. Um, so I'm gonna talk for maybe about 10 minutes at most. Um, it, it's gonna start off with uh, a very short introduction to, to NURBS curves. Uh, and then I'll talk about how I use them to, to generate two-dimensional two aerofoils um, for my research. Um, so for the introduction, um, a kind of, you know, the, the, the level of detail is, you know, the sort of thing that you can find uh, if you, you know, Google for nerves and basis lines on, on, on the internet. Um, and then the aerofoil stuff is, um, you know, things that I uh, learned uh, at the Whittle Lab. So NURBS is the acronym for non-uniform rational basis blinds. Um, so let's, let's take that one at a time. So a, a spline is a piecewise polynomial. Um, this, this image is off of Wikipedia. Um, can you see the pointer? Yeah, you can probably see the pointer. Um, so you can yes, we can see kind it. of three three curves joined together. Um, so that that's where that kind of um, that's what it means to, to, to have a spline. 
Um, basis functions uh, are a bit of mathematics that I don't fully understand, um, but they're kind of linearly combined to form uh, these spline functions. And then they're kind of defined by control points and knots. Um, so in the in the image that these black dots are control points. Um, and, and the knots kind of uh, determine how, how the basis functions relate to, to these control points to give, give you this curve. Uh, more on that in a sec. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention here is that um, the, the spline function, the B-spline function, uh, has an argument. Uh, and the argument is a sort of distance along the curve. Uh, so you might say, you know, t equals zero reverse to it. Maybe this is the start. And then as t increases, you go along. Uh, and then t equals one, you'd probably uh, you know, finish off uh, there. And then the, the knots are defined as uh, different values of t. So control points have the largest influence on the curve shape, um, but knots determine how much of a curve is affected by a single control point. Um, so for example, here uh, you can see, you know, just moving that one control point um, changes the curve kind of locally, um, but doesn't really affect the, the curve uh, all the way out here. Um, and for most kind of B-spline use cases, uh, a uniform uh, kind of selection of knots is, is perfectly fine. Um, so with non-uniform knots, uh, you can give one control point more influence uh, on the curve. Um, but usually when you talk about non-uniformity, it's, it's more extreme than that. Um, so you can have duplicate knots uh, to make a curve less smooth. So for example, uh, a cubic spline will become quadratic at the, you know, if, if there's a duplicate knot at that point, it will, it will switch from being cubic to quadratic. Um, and then if you add enough duplicate points, you can, you can add a kind of sharp corner um, or even a discontinuity um, to your curve. Uh, and then the last letter in the acronym that I'll explain is R, which stands for rational. Um, so it's not actually possible to represent um, circles and ellipses exactly using piecewise polynomials. Um, but what you can do is you can project a higher dimensional polynomial curve to obtain um, an exact representation of you know, a conic section. So, you know, for example, you can project a 3D curve into two dimensions uh, to get an exact circle. Um, now in, in NURBS books and, uh, and, and libraries, um, this extra dimension is usually called the weight. Um, and the weight is defined on control points. Uh, so you can think of, uh, you know, a, a, a control point with more weight will pull the curve towards it. Uh, and then this, this just shows kind of different conic sections. So you have circles, ellipses, um, parabolas, hyperbola, uh, hyperbolas. Okay, so now you know a little bit, of, little bit about NURBS. Um, they're a special type of B-spline that can have varying levels of smoothness and they can exactly represent conic sections uh, such as circles and ellipses. Um, and kind of just a, just a little bit of history, um, the, the origins of these you know, uh, draft people apparently used to have kind of bendy pieces of wood um, that were kind of held in position by lead weights. Um, so you know, nerves of Nerves are the kind of algorithmic representation of a, of a very similar thing where you have control points acting as kind of weights, um, which I thought was funny. Um, so yeah, next I'm going to talk about aerofoils. Um, there are many ways of specifying aerofoil cross sections. Um, the method that I used for my research was to combine a camber curve uh, with a thickness curve. Um, and for those of you that don't know what camber is, it's kind of useful to think of it backwards. So if you start with the kind of two-dimensional aerofoil, uh, the camber line is calculated as the set of points that's kind of halfway between the upper and lower curves. Um, and then the, you know, the, the thickness is kind of just added on kind of ten, uh, perpendicularly to, to all of these, um, you know, it's kind of laid on top of the, uh, the camber curve uh, at the top and at the bottom. Um, so using this method um, doesn't necessarily tell you how the upper and lower surfaces will be joined at the leading edge or at the trailing edge of the aerofoil. Um, and in my, in, in my work, I used um, nerves to generate multiple kind of joining curves um, and also to switch between parabolic and circular shapes. 
uh, a quick aside with aerofoils, you usually have to design them to be curvature continuous to get the best performance. And to clarify what I mean is on the right, we've got continuous curvature all the way around here because it's a circle and then a discontinuity um, where the curvature jumps to infinity. Uh, and then this is a kind of discontinuity in gradient. So discontinuity in curvature there and discontinuity in gradient there. Uh, and then on the left for comparison, um, you can just, you know, I've just moved some control points around to give a kind of smoother, you know, curvature continuous um, shape. So, so it should look smoother. You know, I mean, uh, eyeballs can usually pick up, you know, big changes in curvature. So you might notice like something here, but you know, this this bit looks uh, looks quite smooth. Uh, anyway, so putting this putting all of this together. Um, the algorithm that I used to join uh, was simply to kind of append uh, the, the three curves together, uh, add a knot on either side of the join, uh, and then remove all the duplicate knots. Um, so in, in the plot, I've got you know these, these three uh, kind of uh, component curves with their control points shown, uh, and then the kind of joined curve on the on the right, um, which hopefully looks looks quite smooth. You know, in theory, it's curvature continuous. Um, I can also show in the next two slides um, the kind of very small changes in control points that take place as part of this join. So you know, this is the this is the kind of uh, the three curves before you join and then after join. Um, you know, there's, there's a very small change, um, but the kind of yeah the, the circular aspect is preserved and you know most of this curve and uh, you know the, the, the upper surface and the lower surface sorry um, curve uh, are are still preserved. Um, and then changing the weight of just that one control point um, makes the curve parabolic instead of circular. So, so again, I'm going to flick between two slides. Um, so this is this is circular, and then if I change the weight of that point to one, it becomes parabolic. Um, and then you know, looking at the the join as well, um, it's a very localized change. The rest of the curve isn't affected, and the, and the join is still kind of uh, curvature continuous. Um, and that's pretty much it. So just to finish off, um, this is a you know PyData uh, talk, so I, um, I should mention Python. Uh, I'm aware of only two Python libraries uh, for working with NURBS. Um, so I used PyNURBS for my research and then uh, GeomDL um, to make the, the plots of this presentation. Um, I don't think PyNURBS is actively maintained anymore. So if you're thinking of using NURBS, you're probably better off using um, the, the second of the two. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, that there might well be kind of better ways of joining um, curves to uh, nodes curves together. So you know, if anyone in the audience has experience with um, you know using uh, using these curves in you know uh, CAD or CAM, then please let me know. Thank you. Um, uh, I guess I can take questions at this point. Yes, please. Um... Again, uh, sorry, I'm trying to see how to. Are there, are there any questions? I, I think I'm going to give everybody time to think of good question to ask uh, something myself. Um, maybe it's uh, so, so I, I have to say, um, I have to actually make a two question. We'll, we'll see. Um, uh, one one is probably very simple, but I, I have to I, I have to sort of like uh, uh, stand up and say very clearly I'm not hundred percent sure how an aerofoil is defined. I, I get it's it's sort of like it had sort of the shape of a of a of a wing in an aeroplane. Is is it just is it just that, or does it have a more general meaning? Um, I'm not. Sure, I understand what you mean. Um, so you know, you, you could say that something something like this, you know, with with a uh, with the, the upper and lower surfaces uh, joined, is a is a two D aerofoil. Yes. Uh, and then if you you know actually wanted to to put it on a, on a plane, um, you'd have to kind of make that into a into an actual volume. So you might have. Um, the same shape, just kind of extruded, 
yeah. Um, yeah. To, to make make your airfoil. Um, and then there's kind of 3D design where where you might kind of uh, you know not just extrude it, but also kind of slightly shrink it as it get you know slightly taper it as you, as you get away from the kind of main fuselage. You might sweep it backwards uh, for um, good um, yeah good aerodynamic kind of practice. Um, but yeah, th this is just considering um, the, the kind of just the just the two D section. Yes, yes, does, no, does that yes, make sense? yes, absolutely. Uh, you 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 have you have exactly answered my question. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I see there is a question here um, from uh, from the audience. Um, um, do I, I'm just going to read it out quickly. Do, do nerves and splines have mathematical properties, making them useful in data fitting? My limited understanding suggests they are good for meeting edge and boundary conditions. Um, again, I might need to ask for, for a clarification on the question, but yeah, um, splines uh, are quite often um, used to kind of, you know, fit a curve to a, a bunch of data points. Um, there's, you know, um, uh, functions built into to NumPy, for example, for, for fitting a B-spline um, if, if you've got a set of data points. Um, some of these NURBS libraries do have um, kind of built-in functions for uh, fitting, you know, uh, a spline to your data. Um, but I, I guess most of the time, you know, just regular B splines are good enough. So maybe that's why people don't tend to have um, algorithms for fitting NURBS. Um, but yeah, the algorithms do exist. Does that, does that kind of answer your question? I'm. I don't see. I don't see a response. So I, I guess the, the, this answered the question. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um. I. I. I gather your your work um was related in sort of like finding good uh shapes. Or two D shapes for such an aerofoil. Is that is that right? And um, how do you how do you then? I mean, how do you then evaluate the, the 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 quality of that design or the shape that you found? What, um, what's your so what's your yeah? There's there's different levels of um, kind of evaluation. Um, probably in the first instance, you can do a two D uh, simulation. Um, so you know you're just just looking at the kind of flow around uh, this, this this 2D shape. Um, the next step up would be doing a 3D simulation. You might have kind of uh, time accurate simulations. Um, so so no, that, that's the kind of simulation um, side of things. Uh, and then obviously you can just uh, print off you know in a 3D printer um, this this aerofoil. You can you know just just extrude it um, and Kind of tested in the wind tunnel, um, so yeah, that, that's kind of different levels of uh, evaluation. If that if that kind of makes sense, um, but usually you you get a you get a reasonably good uh, idea of how well uh, the shape is going to do just based on your two D and three D simulations, uh, and then if it's kind of very specific, you know, fine tuning that you need to do, um, that's when you might look at you know unsteady um, you know time accurate simulations uh, or looking at wind tunnel uh, wind tunnel data. Yeah, yeah, that sounds very interesting. Another question. Um, yes. With the airfoil example, many different splines will fit to join the bottom and top curves. What is optimized in choosing the best spline? Um, I don't know. I, I haven't done a kind of optimization exercise. Um, I just needed something that would work. <laughs> um, so you know, you, you, you kind of going down the uh, joining splines um, method is, is is one approach uh, that I was saying of um, specifying aerofoil cross sections. Uh, another way that you can um, specify uh, aerofoils is is you start with this kind of camber distribution. Um, 
And the way that you kind of generate your uh, upper and lower surfaces uh, is that you kind of roll a circle um, around the, uh, the, 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 the kind of camber line. Um, so that the, the, the radius of the circle will, will start off here um, with this kind of thickness. Um, but then by the time it gets here, the circle will have grown to kind of that thickness, that radius. Uh, and so if you do that, then you get you know a full layer of foil without needing to join anything. Um, or you can have kind of um, uh, kind of fully fully uh, algorithmically specified aerofoils. So um, the NACA, which is the kind of uh, precursor to NASA, um, has, for example, uh, a four series of aerofoils. Um, so, so you can specify your whole uh, 2D aerofoil just using four digits. Uh, and it's and it's things like where is the the location of uh, maximum camber and what's the the maximum thickness of the aerofoil, uh, and you can you know using just those four digits and you know the 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 kind of aerofoil generation uh, formula um, generate a, a whole family of aerofoils uh, without even you know getting into mind. Um, yeah, I, I guess I used NURBS because I wanted to be able to make that circular um, leading edge, uh, but also um, look at parabolic. Um, but you know, if you, if you were only looking at parabolic, then you could probably get away with just a just a regular uh, you know, uniform um, basis plane. Interesting. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I'll stop sharing, I guess. Uh, any more questions? I, I don't see any more questions. Uh, I don't hear anything else. Um, okay, um, again, thanks a lot to, to both speakers, Nishat and Tariq. Um, that's both very interesting talks. And um, um, what I think I also forgot to say at the beginning was that um, we, the PyData Cambridge, uh, meetup we're going to have uh, a, a break uh, for of of virtual meetups for for a little bit just be, just because we've been we've been uh, uh, going for a while through the pandemic and I said we, we I thought we, we deserve a bit of a break but we are looking to um, resume with in-person meetups in due course and if you're interested in presenting or if you have ideas for for um, things that you want to hear about, please do reach out and, uh, you know, we would be very happy to talk. Um, okay, um, that's that's it for, for today. And thanks a lot for, for everyone who dived in, to all the speakers, and uh, hope to see you all soon again. Okay, bye-bye. Very much. Thanks. Have a nice evening. Bye. Have a good evening. <laughs>